Hello, this is Martin from uh, Edu Musica, uh, and today uh, Paola Virtala from Finland will tell us a little bit about um, how music can help mitigating uh, problems like dyslexia. So please go ahead and tell us uh, more about it. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello. So uh, I work in the Cognitive Brain Research Unit and we uh, study a phenomena like language and music and how they are uh, developing and, and shaping the brain. And currently I'm working on dyslexia and the promises of music in its rehabilitation and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So this is the content overview of my talk. Uh, I thought I would uh, start by describing uh, developmental dyslexia. And, and its neural correlates, so it, how, it, how it is uh, seen in the brain. Uh, then I'll move on to the transfer effects of music on language skills, so what we know uh, about studies on music training and musical uh, abilities and how they are associated with different uh, speech and language related skills and functions. And then I will talk about uh, music interventions and, and dyslexia rehabilitation, so the evidence we know already. So first about uh, dyslexia and its neural correlates. Uh, developmental dyslexia is characterized as difficulties in reading and writing uh, despite normal intelligence. So even if the child has normal vision and normal intelligence and, and all the possibilities for education, there are still persistent difficulties in learning to read and write and these uh, difficulties often often persist until adulthood. Uh, it is the most common learning disorder, so around 80% of all learning disabled are dyslexics, and it is uh, also quite prevalent in, in all countries, so the prevalence in school age is uh, from 5 up to 20%. The big range uh, is uh, dependent on, on the fact that dyslexia is a continuum, so it can be very uh, mild, with only mild problems in, in learning to read, or then very severe uh, problems that persist well into adulthood and also affect the, the education possibilities and, and the later life. Uh, it is uh, very comorbid with many similar disorders uh, related to brain development. Uh, other learning disabilities di like dyscalculia, uh, which is related to mathematical skills, uh, ADHD, which is an attention deficit, and also uh, other pro problems in, in language development, for example, the uh, specific language uh, impairment, SLI. And uh, because of its nature, uh, dyslexia cannot be uh, diagnosed uh, until uh, school age and until actually the reading should have already uh, started, but it hasn't. So uh, it's diagnosed rather late, while many of these comorbid problems are diagnosed much earlier. So if the child has uh, attention problems or, or problems in, in language development uh, in early childhood, it may predict uh, also uh, dyslexia later on, but it also can be that there is no dyslexia in school age, so it's really not uh, possible to tell. Uh, but uh, what can be said uh, is that dyslexia is highly heritable, so uh, if you want to know if your child will develop dyslexia, uh, the family history is, is the best place to start looking. So uh, if, if uh, the twin, uh, a mon monozygotic twin has dyslexia, uh, the other twin will have dyslexia uh, in almost 70% of the cases, so it's quite quite uh, heritable. Uh, in, in families where one parent is dyslexic, dyslexic the prevalence in, in children is around 50%, again, uh, a bit depending on the study and the severity of dyslexia. And the case is about the same is if a sibling is dyslexic, for example. Uh, many candidate genes of dyslexia have been found, uh, and they are uh, related to uh, important function in, uh, functions in the in the brain maturation process. So, for example, the neuronal migration that happens in while the neuronal cells uh, 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 
migrate to their right places in the in the cortex and in the brain structures. So this is, for example, affected by the candidate genes of, of dyslexia. The current leading theory on the main cause of dyslexia is, is the so-called phonological deficit uh, theory. Uh, this means that an impairment uh, related to phonological processing would be the, the main impairment in dyslexia that would then lead to all the other problems in, in reading and so on. And what phonological processing means uh, is the, the mental representation and processing uh, of speech sounds. So in order to understand uh, how, uh, how language maps into, into written text, we have to understand that phonemes uh, are, are uh, small units of language that uh, are combined to uh, form words and, and syllables and sentences and so on. And uh, in order to do this, we have to understand the, the small elements of speech and be able to process them in a very efficient way. And this would then be impaired in dyslexia. And the uh, uh, phonological processing uh, starts very early in development because uh, the native language phonemes and their neural representations have to be formed already during the first year of development, and this would also sort of point out, out to the very early uh, phases of development in, in uh, dyslexia and how it is formed. There are also other sensory uh, deficits in dyslexia uh, related to auditory and visual systems, and then also uh, motor deficits. So uh, the phonological processing is not the only thing that is impaired in, in dyslexics, but uh, it has been uh, it has been uh, said that it would be the ma main uh, main route to the later problems anyway, because not all the dyslexics have sensory or motor deficits, but but uh, all of them or almost all of them tend to have these phonological difficulties. So they are sort of in the core of dyslexia. Uh, this is some uh, uh, brain evidence on on dyslexia and the. Uh, abnormalities that are seen in the brains of dyslexics. So if we look at these uh, brain figures uh, with uh, pink dots uh, indicating uh, the uh, areas that have shown uh, abnormalities in, in different dyslexic individuals, we see that they are more evident in the left hemisphere than in the right hemisphere and that they are sort of focused around uh, this uh, fissure that is called the sylvian fissure that is very much related to auditory processing in the brain. So in the left auditory areas that process uh, phonological information are, are affected in dyslexics. And these uh, abnormalities are, are at least partly genetically driven. Uh, what is known from the uh, functional brain evidence is that uh, dyslexia is very much related to deficits in auditory processing. So uh, dyslexics have uh, difficulties in processing many kinds of auditory material, not only speech, but also uh, basic uh, auditory features like pitch and duration of sounds. Uh, this uh, figure shows an example of uh, an MEG study uh, that uh, studied uh, processing of of pitch changes, or so frequency changes, and what was seen uh, that while in healthy controls, the activity was uh, evident and strong in both hemispheres uh, related to this uh, change in, uh, in a sound frequency. In the dyslexics, the left hemisphere uh, is very much uh, different from, from the right and, and also different from the healthy control group. So the left hemisphere is somehow uh, somehow deficient in processing auditory information. And the left hemisphere is, of course, important for speech processing and language processing. Uh, this is one example study uh, where diminished brain responses were seen in dyslexics uh, in response to frequency changes, but not for duration changes. These uh, responses do vary between studies uh, when it comes to what auditory processes are affected and what uh, not. Uh, but anyway, this is an example of, of a study that clearly showed that when a pitch change becomes uh, smaller, so when it
when it comes more difficult to detect the difference between a, a healthy control group and the dyslexic group also grows bigger so when the controls are about in the in the level of the uh, dyslexics so the dyslexics and controls process uh, uh, the, uh, in the same way these uh, big differences in frequency uh, the smaller the frequency change gets the more impaired the solid line the dyslexic subjects become and this uh, response to the change is retained only in the in the healthy control group and in uh, sound duration change we don't see this same difference so uh, the response gets bigger uh, when the duration change gets bigger in both groups but there is no uh, large difference between the two groups in this study the, the brain responses were also correlated with uh, reading errors so the reading skills of the dyslexics actually correlated with these very basic level auditory responses so this would indicate that the, the auditory systems responses have some real uh, real significance in, in dyslexia and the, and the dyslexic symptoms. Uh, it seems that the problems in auditory processing uh, may also precede dyslexia and uh, be evident in, in children who have a familial risk for dyslexia without being dyslexic themselves, at least not yet. Uh, this is a Finnish study by Riikka Lovia and colleagues uh, where six-year-old children uh, with a familial risk for dyslexia uh, were studied and these children also had some reading related difficulties uh, so they had both a genetic risk and then a, a, a risk uh, when looking at their uh, reading related skills and they uh, participated in, a, in a, a study where they were presented with a sound stream with speech sound changes and uh, brain responses to these speech sound changes were then compared between the uh, the risk children and, and the then healthy control children with no risk for dyslexia and what was seen uh, was that many uh, important uh, speech related features were uh, somehow uh, abnormally or poorly processed by the dyslexia risk group so the negative response seen here uh, is diminished uh, in the at-risk children for a vowel change and a consonant change uh, and a sound intensity change uh, and a vowel duration change but not so much for vowel uh, frequency and uh, all the other components are sort of relevant in a speech context in, in Finnish uh, language but frequency not so much so it makes sense sort of that all the speech related features were uh, poorly processed in the dyslexic group um, brain responses uh, to phoneme changes for example uh, seem to also predict uh, later uh, development uh, regarding uh, reading skills uh, this is an uh, example of a study uh, where children were studied in, in kindergarten so they were around five and then they were followed up until until school age and their reading skills were then measured uh, in, in school age and and when this group was uh, divided to uh, good and poor readers based on their uh, reading level in, in school age uh, it could actually be seen that the group uh, difference was evident also in the in the kindergarten uh, uh, brain responses to a phoneme. Uh, what was seen was that in the good reading uh, group, the left hemisphere processed uh, the phonemes uh, strongly, and there was basically nothing, uh, no activation in the right hemisphere. So they had this uh, adult-like uh, strong uh, lateralization of of language information to the left hemisphere uh, whereas in the poor reading group the the activation was sort of more uh, diverse it was on both hemispheres and it wasn't as strong as in the good reading group so the early brain responses uh, can predict later outcomes this has also been studied in infants and this is what I'm currently doing as well 
uh, I'll show you some older studies. Uh, this is a study by uh, Paavo Leppänen and colleagues, uh, and uh, they recorded brain Paola, responses. Uh, just a second, I can't yes. see uh, the presentation anymore. I lost uh -huh. it. Can you share the screen again or something? Uh, I just lost you. Just a second. But otherwise, yeah, th this is really very interesting and very important, especially for, uh, I'm mostly interested in, let's say, early childhood uh, education of children. So uh, evidently, aha, I can see the screen again. Okay, perfect. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, evidently, there's poor uh, processing of the of the sounds of the yes. pitch yeah. frequency, uh, mostly that. Uh, not so much the duration, right? But mostly the pitch, as I understood. Yeah, it depends a li little on the studies. So. Mm -hmm. so it's hard to draw conclusions on what features are actually affected and what not, but evidently many features are affected. So, so very basic level auditory processing anyway. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I can see it. So please continue. Shall I continue or go back a little or? Uh, you can continue. Okay. So what I was uh, saying was that uh, this is a study by Paavo Leppänen and colleagues. Uh, again from Finland uh, on uh, infants at risk for dyslexia and uh, here they recorded uh, brain responses to a consonant duration change and uh, vowel and consonant duration changes are very relevant in, in Finnish language uh, which was again the native language of the infants and these were six month old uh, infants uh, with a familial risk for dyslexia and what was seen was again uh, abnormal processing of, of speech in the left hemisphere. So uh, in the in the left uh, areas uh, of the of the brain, uh, the response uh, to the consonant duration change was uh, diminished in in the uh, at risk group, but it was normal in the in the control group and in the right hemisphere. There was no difference between the groups, and this was seen already in the six month old infants. And this is a similar study on infants with a family history uh, for language learning impairment. So a similar uh, impairment that is very comorbid with dyslexia. And what they saw here was that a uh, brain response to a pitch change uh, was uh, diminished in the left hemisphere again in infants with a family history of, of this language learning impairment. So again, not only speech cha changes, but also uh, changes in basic auditory features like pitch can be uh, diminished in in these language related uh, developmental disorders. And there was also a response in the early, early, uh, early brain response, uh, one component that actually correlated with the two year vocabulary. So again, the later language skills were correlated with the very early brain responses. So what I uh, now showed you was that the signs of dyslexia can be seen very early in how the brain processes auditory and speech information. And the brain responses to speech sounds uh, in childhood can also predict later reading skills. And it seems that the very early brain responses can, uh, in fact, uh, predict later language and reading outcomes. So maybe by affecting the auditory processing in the brain, dyslexia could be uh, ameliorated or even prevented if starting really early. Then I'm going to move on to the transfer effects of music on language skills. So what we know about uh, music and language is that they share many, many features. They are both uh, human made culture dependent sounds that require learning and, and in inculturation. So we don't, we are not born with uh, a language or, or a music system, but we actually learn them uh, when we are growing up uh, as a members of, of some culture. Uh, both music and language are complex and structured audit auditory material that unfolds over time. So they, they require auditory memory processes. And they are also uh, systems where uh, small units are combined to larger units. 
and they both have rules and a syntax. They are also both very social and communicative and, and emotional by nature. And uh, even if uh, music is not uh, as uh, easy to, to sort of interpret as, as language, uh, it still uh, evokes a lot of uh, emotions and it, and it sort of tries to communicate uh, emotions or, or even more uh, specific messages. So they definitely share a lot, and this is of course also reflected in the in the brain networks that process music and language. And we know that they are partly uh, separate and partly uh, overlapping in the brain. Uh, what we know about uh, music uh, is that uh, musical activities and music training are associated with many uh, facilitated auditory sk skills, uh, not only uh, in, in music processing, but also uh, in basic auditory uh, processing. This is an example of a study by uh, Vesa Putkinen uh, where uh, many uh, basic features like uh, sound duration and uh, the temporal structure of the, of the sound and sound frequency and sound intensity and, and location of the sound were correlated with musical activities at home. And this uh, strongly suggests that uh, musical activities shape the the auditory system in a very uh, profound level. Uh, we know that many uh, musical skills and, and music training uh, is uh, associated with, with language skills. Uh, this is seen uh, especially in speech processing and production. Uh, we know that uh, music training is associated with better speech processing, uh, not only in, in music, but also in speech stimuli and that music training is associated with better processing of speech in noise. And this is a highly relevant task because we often listen uh, to speech in, in very noisy environments. And this is uh, often the place where, for, ex for example, a foreign, uh, a speaker of foreign language has troubles when, when, when he can't concentrate fully on the speaker, but there is like this uh, background uh, noise that has to be somehow uh, inhibited to be able to process uh, speech efficiently. Uh, music perception is also associated with prosody perception in speech. So uh, prosody in, in speech and then melodic features in music is again one uh, big overlap in, in music and language. Uh, but also speech production may be facilitated by music. So uh, in a study by Ria Milovanov, it was uh, shown that a musical aptitude was associated with facilitated pronunciation of a foreign language. So the, the people who were uh, better uh, in, in music were actually better in pronouncing uh, foreign language. Uh, many more uh, complex and not so uh, uh, this is sort of evident that uh, speech processing is uh, affected by music training because music training uh, is, is highly uh, effective on, on the uh, auditory areas of the brain. But uh, then when we think about more complex linguistic processes uh, like phonological processing and reading and verbal memory and, and verbal intelligence, uh, it is more surprising maybe that, that musical uh, training may, may uh, have associations with them. Uh, what is known is that, for example, phoneme awareness and reading skills are associated with music skills, uh, even when many other features like, uh, like general intelligence are controlled for. Uh, musical training is also related to verbal memory skills, so memorizing uh, verbal uh, items. And this is, of course, also auditory memory at the same time. Uh, in children, uh, length of music training was associated with reading comprehension performance, uh, even when uh, the study controlled for age and uh, education uh, background and, and auditory perception skills and IQ and so on and so on. So it seems that there is a real association uh, with uh, music training and, and reading. Uh, this is an interesting study uh, with infants uh, who participated in a music-making class. Uh, this is a well-known uh, study
study by Laurel Trainer and colleagues. And what they saw was that an active uh, music making uh, class uh, was positively associated with with the pre-verbal uh, communicative uh, development. So the amount of these uh, gestures related to uh, to communication, like uh, waving or reaching for things and, and stuff like this, uh, was uh, these gestures were were more evident in the uh, group that got active music training than in a group that participated in a more passive uh, play class where uh, music was only uh, music was passively uh, engaged, so it was uh, playing on the background. So in many le many levels, it it seems that uh, music uh, is associated with uh, linguistic functions. So they share many brain areas and networks and music training, both explicit and rather implicit, as in the case of small infants, uh, seems to facilitate auditory system development. Uh, music training is associated with many benefits in speech processing and, and several verbal and reading measures. And this can also work both ways. So uh, not only can music enhance uh, speech processing, but also uh, speech processing can enhance music processing. Uh, this is an example uh, where speakers of a tonal language uh, were better at processing pitch also in music. So it's nice that it seems to work both ways. Uh, I have some words of caution. Uh, first of all, many of these results are correlational rather than causal. And when there is a correlational uh, connection, uh, it is important to remember that uh, children are engage, engaged in music uh, training for many reasons, and they are not randomly assigned for, for music training. And, and the far, uh, farther we go uh, from uh, music training uh, in these transfer effects. So if we see, if we see effects of music on, on something like uh, uh, processing pitch in language, uh, it is sort of easy to understand how this uh, how this uh, association is formed and how music can shape the auditory brain areas. But then, if we talk about uh, reading skills or or more general verbal uh, uh, intellectual scores or something, uh, we must be cautious in how we interpret uh, correlational data. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, a lot of recent evidence on how. Uh, many uh, things that we uh, sort of think uh, are uh, tr due to training are actually uh, at least partly due to uh, genetic factors. So uh, Glenn Schellenberg has, has uh, written about uh, how children actually uh, seek out uh, environments uh, that are consistent with their predispositions. So a child that is interested in music is, is likely uh, also uh, better in music and and uh, enjoys it and then when such a child uh, is engaged with uh, music uh, lessons the environment sort of uh, exaggerates the, the pre-existing pre uh, individual differences so there are some uh, differences to begin with that sort of partly uh, cause the child to, to start playing an instrument but of course we know uh, from music training for example that there are also many many uh, randomized uh, studies where the children are actually uh, randomized to, to music training and, and some other hobbies and we still see uh, brain effects so it's not only only uh, uh, seeking out certain environments but this is a factor that has to be uh, remembered as well uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, music interventions and dyslexia rehabilitation, and I will present some recent uh, interventions and how they are uh, conducted and what results they show. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to note that uh, music and language have a special connection in, in the early interaction of the parent and infant. So we know from, from infant studies that uh, while infant-directed speech is very appealing to infants, uh, infant-directed singing is even more appealing to infants. So infants really much like to uh, listen to, to singing. 
and actually infant directed singing has uh, speech has many singing like features so this is an example of of uh, how infant uh, directed speech looks like compared to adult directed speech so uh, adult directed speech has a very flat uh, frequency uh, it's it stays on the same frequency level there are some breaks uh, but they are not always between words so it's really hard to sort of follow the uh, the prosodic uh, structure of the of the speech uh, while in the infant directed speech the frequency range is huge and the word boundaries are very much pronounced and the pauses are longer and there is repetition and also the the content of the talk is very emotional so when we talk to small infants it's almost like a performance to the infants when where we are really trying to catch the infants attention uh, parents use songs with infants uh, a lot uh, for example for emotion regulation and this maybe explains why why the infant directed speech is so so emotional so we use lullabies to get infants to sleep and play songs to get them laughing or so on and also in the early development it seems that music and movement and rhythm are very much intertwined so uh, if an infant uh, hears music for example uh, they naturally start moving and uh, during pregnancy when the infant is still in the in the womb the the womb is a very multimodal learning environment so the auditory uh, environment and and uh, things happening in the auditory environment are sort of uh, transferred to the infant uh, via the mother and the mother's reactions to the sounds so for example if the mother moves to music or breathes more heavily while uh, dancing and listening to rhythmic music it is a very multimodal uh, experience to the infant uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, studies already on music and, and dyslexia and many uh, important uh, uh, reviews uh, have been published on, on these topics these are two that I, I liked to, to highlight the other is from 2006 by uh, Paula Talal and Nadine Gav uh, regarding the uh, idea that uh, dynamic uh, rapid, rapid auditory processing is impaired in dyslexia and uh, musical experience might support this uh, processing. And the other is by Nina Kraus and uh, Bharat uh, Chandra Sekaran on uh, music training for the development of auditory skills, which is a more uh, broad view on, on music training and its uh, effects. Uh, here is uh, a model presented by uh, Paula Talal and Nadine Gav in their review on how music training uh, affects uh, language. So uh, they uh, note that while we don't really know how these uh, associations are formed and what affects uh, what, uh, we still know that uh, music training is at least correlated positively with, with many music processing uh, skills, then many general auditory processing skills related to uh, at least pitch and, and then these uh, rapid uh, spectral and temporal features of, of auditory stream. And then there are the language and literacy skills, for example, reading, uh, phonological processing, pitch processing, prosody and verbal memory and fluency. So these are all associated with music training, but we, uh, according to them, at uh, 10 years ago, at least, we didn't really know uh, how these are sort of put together. Uh, they also present this uh, model, uh, which is actually a, a, an improved model of, of Katie Overy's uh, older uh, model on how music training is related to uh, reading skills. Uh, they uh, present these steps uh, uh, how the how the connection is formed so music training is is affecting the auditory uh, processing of, of rapid uh, spectral and temporal changes uh, in the in the auditory stream 
and this leads to uh, improvements in processing of linguistic components like syllables, so rapid dynamic uh, uh, linguistic information. And this then leads to improved uh, general language skills of uh, improved uh, general language skills, uh, which then leads to improved uh, literacy skills. And there might be other factors like uh, attention uh, factors that uh, sort of modify and and uh, enhance this uh, connection. And this is the original model by Katie Overy, uh, which uh, is a bit uh, more simple, but uh, it still has this idea of, of some uh, low-level auditory processing abilities. Uh, in this model, they are related to temporal processing uh, that uh, then uh, enhance uh, language skills, for example, in phonological segmentation, which then leads to uh, improved uh, literacy skills. And in 2000 and 2003, uh, Katie Overy has published uh, studies on classroom music lessons for children and how they uh, might uh, improve reading in, in dyslexics and healthy uh, children as well. And these music lessons were focused on rhythm and timing, so the temporal aspects of, of music, because she thinks that it is sort of the key factor in, in dyslexia and the problems in dyslexia. And what they saw uh, was a positive effect on, on phonological and spelling skills uh, after this uh, music lessons, but are uh, not for reading. So for some reasons, uh, the effects were not seen in reading, even though they were seen in, in spelling and phonological skills, which are very much related to reading, of course. Some uh, more recent studies on, on how to improve language with music. A study by Sylvain Moreno uh, had uh, eight-year-old children randomly assigned to two interventions. Uh, one group got six months of music training and the other one got six months of painting training. And I have some green uh, uh, highlights here. So uh, let's appreciate the random assignment in the study and then also the the meaningful control intervention because in many studies on music training there is uh, no control intervention or or only a passive uh, uh, follow-up. So let's appreciate the real uh, control intervention here. The music training uh, was uh, focused on, on rhythm, melody, harmony, basically all the relevant aspects of, of music. While the painting training wa was then focused on visual uh, aspects, uh, for example, visual spatial performance. Uh, what was seen only in the music training uh, group was uh, facilitated performance in a word reading task. So uh, this, uh, these uh, bars represent uh, different uh, uh, difficulty levels of word reading. So in this inconsistent condition, the words and the, uh, the words did not easily sort of uh, the pronunciation was very different from how the word was was spelled, so it was a more challenging task. And in this task, the uh, percentage of errors uh, dropped in the in the uh, music group, but not so much in the in the painting group. And of course, both groups uh, developed a little because they were eight year olds, and they should and they should of course improve. Uh, they also uh, recorded uh, brain responses to a pitch change and uh, they also conducted a behavioral uh, pitch uh, discrimination task. And what was seen was that only in the music training, the uh, processing of pitch information in, in speech was facilitated and this was visible in the brain responses to pitch changes. So the gray area shows the difference between the before and after training responses, and only in the music group there are differences uh, between before and after conditions, whereas the painting group stays pretty much the same. And these are different conditions of the speech task. And here it's 
oh, it wasn't visible, but I just wanted to highlight here that, of course, this task is uh, is auditory, and only the music intervention was was focusing on auditory uh, material. So it sort of makes sense that an auditory intervention is better for the auditory system than than the painting uh, intervention, which was visual by nature. But still. Uh, this is a, an infant study, uh, which I am keen on myself. Uh, so uh, nine-month-old infants in this study participated in a short intervention. Uh, there was a social music intervention, and then there was a social play without music intervention. So there was sort of a control intervention, but it was more like uh, the same without music. And the music intervention focused on, on teaching the triple meter, so the waltz meter, and, and it was a multimodal intervention where they uh, bound to the infants, uh, the infants to the rhythm, and they uh, clapped the rhythm, and, and so on. So it was again sort of focused on the rhythmic and temporal aspects of music. And what was seen in the music intervention group was that they improved in temporal processing of speech. So the intervention group had a larger response to a change in the temporal structure. There was a, a repeating a, a bibi a pseudo word and then a deviant bibi, a shorter pseudo word. And uh, the difference between these uh, elicited a brain response that was larger in the intervention than in the control group. But again, of course, the music intervention was, was auditory, while the social play was, was sort of less focused on auditory uh, processing. But still, speech processing improved in, due to music training in this pre-verbal uh, infant group. Uh, moving on to dyslexia. So what we know about dyslexia is that it can be ameliorated. And uh, rehabilitating dyslexia can affect uh, also the neural levels of, of speech processing. So uh, this uh, uh, illustration is from the Grafo game, which is a, a Finnish uh, game uh, designed to teach graph grapheme phoneme associations. Uh, so for example, in this uh, session, uh, the child has to uh, try to uh, 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 associate uh, this uh, grapheme uh, with the right phoneme. So this is O and this is Ö. And what happens in the in the in the play is that the child hears uh, a voice uh, pronouncing one of these uh, these phonemes, for example Ö, and then uh, she has to uh, be able to click to the right uh, right uh, corresponding uh, grapheme. And then if if she does, then the ghost is is happy and the ghost can move forward to the next level. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show a study on six-year-olds uh, who were at risk for dyslexia. Uh, again, they had a familial risk and then they had some reading-related uh, early difficulties. And uh, they participated in this uh, grapho game for a short period of time. And what was seen uh, after the intervention was an enhancement in uh, a brain response to a speech sound change. So it, it grew larger in the intervention group, but not in the control group during the follow-up period. So in the neural level of speech sound processing, we see a difference uh, after a, a short uh, intervention like this. So dyslexia can be, can be rehabilitated in this level, and it also uh, is visible in the in the level of the reading skills, which is of course very positive. So here we see that the two groups and and both groups, uh, the intervention and the control groups, improved in many uh, skills uh, related to uh, reading as they should be uh, improving in this age. But uh, for example, in recognizing letters, uh, in writing syllables and non-words and in writing uh, words and non-words, we see progress in the intervention group only, and the control group is, is uh, barely uh, progressing, or uh, at least the difference isn't significant between the pre and post testing. So it seems that 
uh, even if dyslexia is very uh, uh, biological and genetic and, and innate, it can still be uh, rehabilitated in childhood and also later on. Uh, this is a musical intervention on dyslexia. Uh, musical is maybe a bit of a stretch because this is uh, not really music, but uh, anyway, it's not linguistic. So uh, in this study, dyslexic children participated in a computer-based audiovisual training intervention where they saw these uh, visual patterns and they had to match these patterns with an auditory pattern that they heard. So in, this, uh, in these examples, the different features of the pattern uh, correlate to some auditory features. So uh, this, for example, is a rising pitch pattern and, and the length of the black bar uh, illustrates the duration of the sound and the thickness of the bar illustrates its intensity. So the uh, children had to learn to listen carefully and then judge whether the uh, pattern that they heard uh, was corresponding to the pattern that they see. And what was seen uh, after training was uh, improvement in the training group in, in reading accuracy. And this is uh, quite interesting since this was in no way related to, to reading, of course, uh, but still the number of correctly read words uh, improved markedly in the in the training group and and little but not so much in the control group and there was the similar tendency also in the in the reading speed so they became a bit bit faster but this was uh, fairly significant so it seems that uh, dyslexia can be rehabilitated and and the intervention doesn't have to be uh, uh, verbal or reading based and this is uh, positive because uh, many uh, kids who have troubles with with language and, and reading uh, they uh, can very uh, fast uh, develop a very uh, negative uh, attitude towards reading so if they if there are ways uh, to uh, help uh, reading without actually uh, having to read and read uh, when it's very difficult and annoying it's it's a very positive thing and of course music is is very motivating for many children uh, this is another study uh, a more recent study by habib uh, actually from this year uh, where dyslexic children uh, participated in in only 18 hours of a music-based intervention and they saw many improvements after these 18 hours, uh, improvements in, in speech perception, in auditory attention, in uh, a pseudo-word span. So this is like a, a, a short-term uh, linguistic memory task, auditory memory task, then uh, reading in one minute, and accuracy in a phoneme processing task. So this is an example of, of a phoneme processing task where the uh, accuracy uh, was uh, improving during the intervention and after it, and it actually raised to the level of the of the standard uh, population. And the speed was also uh, well. I guess this was non-significant, so it seems that it becomes more normal the reading speed as well, but it doesn't uh, really change significantly. Another recent uh, musical intervention was uh, by Flau Nacho, published last year uh, in 8 to 11 year old children who participated in, in randomized uh, groups of music or painting training. And again, the, the uh, nice thing here is the randomization and then the control intervention. And this was a seven month uh, intervention where the music training focused on rhythm and temporal processing so it's it's uh, evident in this music intervention that they often focus on rhythmic and temporal aspects. And what was seen in the music group was that they impro improved more than the control group in many reading related uh, abilities, text reading, pseudo word reading, accuracy, uh, repeating Italian pseudo words. Uh, so this is a phonological task, uh, phonemic blending, which means uh, combining heard phonemes into words 
and then a verbal working memory task. And this is an example of the phonemic blending. Uh, what we see in the painting training group is a small improvement in their standardized uh, scores uh, before and after training, but we see a steeper increase in the painting group, uh, in, the, in the music group than in the painting group. Uh, and interestingly, in, in this study, they also had a measure of other than uh, linguistic or reading related skills, and they saw that the painting group actually improved more in perceptual visual spatial reasoning, which is uh, measured by the, the so called block design test. Uh, so, what is nice about this uh, is that often in, in, in studies of, of music, we are sort of only looking the effect of music training and we all only focus on tasks that would show improvement after music training. Uh, so I was uh, happy to see that uh, also the painting group was sort of acknowledged and they of course also improved in something because, because uh, not only music can be effective uh, for uh, development in childhood. Uh, then I'm going to mention our own project. Uh, this is the Dyslexia Baby project that I'm working on currently, and uh, this is uh, in search for the early signs of dyslexia and how to uh, support the de development early on. Uh, we are uh, aiming to find out whether dyslexia is visible in the infant brain and uh, how risk for dyslexia can affect the development of language and auditory skills from early on. So sort of track the early auditory development and see how it predicts later outcomes and how we can support it. Uh, we also study the genetic basis of dyslexia and the possibilities to ameliorate dyslexia. In the study we uh, recruit 200 infants and 150 of them have the familial risk for dyslexia. So at least one parent is dyslexic and uh, we record EEG at birth. Uh, we uh, aim to study brain responses to speech sound changes to see how the uh, early uh, brain responses to speech are formed in these groups. And then uh, we uh, divide the infants to groups who get a music-based intervention or then do not get the inter intervention. And then we also have a healthy uh, control group and uh, after a six month intervention from, from newborn to six months, we uh, conduct a follow up uh, brain recording and, and fill in some questionnaires with the parents and then continue uh, until uh, neuropsychological testing can be done to the infants at two to three years. And we are actually hoping to follow up the infants until they go to school and see the actual outcomes of, of, of dyslexia. And we hope to see who got dyslexia and who didn't, and and how the dyslexia risk, and then also the early uh, brain responses uh, were uh, sort of what uh, predicted the later outcomes in infancy and at two to three years, and whether the uh, music intervention actually affected this development. So whether uh, it was visible in the in the brain responses, in the in the neuropsychological test results of the two to three year olds, and then the later uh, outcome uh, in school age, and we hope to gain understanding on on the linguistic and auditory development in dyslexia, and of course the the promises of of music in its rehabilitation, and uh, find out more about the origin of dyslexia and the early signs in the in the newborn and and small infancy. And we hope to find ways to prevent or ameliorate language problems and dyslexia. Uh, and uh, we are currently working on the on the music intervention with the infants. So uh, to sum up, uh, there is a correlational and causal evidence that music training and music interventions may facilitate language processing and reading. Uh, and in studies of, of music interventions in dyslexia, it is very uh, important uh, to to 
have uh, randomized groups and a good and meaningful control intervention. And also to uh, think about uh, what outcomes to actually measure to see the uh, effects of music training and and also uh, the whole picture of the of the development of the child so that we don't only measure the things that we are very confident that will change future music. Uh, the Talal and Gab model on how music facilitates language is a very uh, good one. Uh, I present here a very uh, simplistic uh, version of that uh, model. Uh, so the connection between music and language skills uh, would uh, go uh, through many different uh, paths. Uh, at least the general cognitive skills may play a role here. For example, the effects on attention or executive functions that music may have. And this may support all cognitive processing and, and also language processing. And then, of course, general auditory skills are uh, important for both music and language. And it's very uh, likely that uh, the benefits of music for language go through general auditory skills. But then there might also be some more specific auditory skills related to this uh, spectrotemporal, uh, fast, dynamic, uh, structured uh, auditory material that are sort of shared between music and language. And, and this is why music would then uh, improve their processing also in the language domain. And there might be some other uh, factors uh, related to the social and, and, and communication functions of, of music that somehow support language through maybe through supporting uh, human interaction. But this is still very hypothetical. Thank you. This is all I wanted to say. Uh, dear Paula, thank you very much. It's been a really interesting, um, uh, fascinating, actually. Um, I have a few questions, if you, uh, if I might bother you with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I'll try uh, to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, what kind of uh, musical interventions are you doing in that uh, project of yours? Uh, that, uh, 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 it's a, uh, it's a sort of a simple uh, passive intervention where the, the parents are given some uh, recorded material uh, that they are playing in the, in the home of the infants, but uh, I'm still sort of uh, reluctant to speak a lot about the intervention okay, details okay, because sorry, it's sorry. still ongoing. Okay, understand. So we are of sort course. of trying to keep that. Uh, understand. Uh, uh, if I go just back also to the GrapheGain um, yes. uh, application or the program, um, so uh, the one with the black bars. Uh, this seems very interesting for me also because uh, what we do, uh, uh, this one, uh, yes. front, no, next, next, uh, next slide, or uh, uh, next one. You mean this one? No, yes, this one, yeah. Yeah, so this is the Audilex game. Audilex. Yes. Um, uh, something like this is what we also do at... Um, uh, music classes for kids for preschool uh, kids in kindergartens, mm -hmm. but we actually draw uh, on a blackboard um, and uh, We kind of show the musical patterns, you know going up or going down so uh, Somehow establishing the connection between the visual uh, stimuli and the audi uh, auditory um, somehow uh, stimuli, you know. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. And this audiovisual uh, integration is sort of one of the uh, one of the processes that uh, does I that is currently studied in dyslexia. So how this uh, making this connection between visual and auditory is, is problematic in dyslexia. Yeah, so it's not just about hearing, it's connection between seeing and hearing, right? So it seems, yes. Yes, yes. Well, it sounds uh, logical. <laughs> Of course, but uh, yeah, establishing really causal connections between that is, uh, I guess, quite difficult. Um, just uh, I I haven't seen uh, good in uh, well enough. Uh, so how was the improvement? How big was the improvement after using this uh, Graphalex uh, game for for a while? Or mm, it, it's of course hard. Uh, I don't really remember correctly how long 
this intervention period was, for okay. example. Um, I think uh, it's sort of hard to say uh, what the the thing that we are always, of course, looking for is the, the significant difference and, yes. the, and the P value, mm -hmm. but okay. what is actually uh, ecologically sort of uh, meaningful and what is uh, effective in, in, in the real world, it's, it's sort of a different story. Mm -hmm. And for example, if we say that there is a, uh, there is a, a, an increase of, of 10 words in the, in the amount of correctly read words, uh, what mm -hmm. does that actually mean? In, in the real world, uh, mm -hmm. and what does it mean for the child? So it's sort of hard to hard to say. Yeah. Hard to say, and it's of course very uh, relevant to to think about that. Of course, of course. Um, yeah, it's been really fascinating. Um, well, thank you uh, very much for your presentation. It's been very thorough, um, and uh, of course, I wish you a lot of uh, luck and success uh, with your projects and your ongoing research. And hopefully we'll hear more about you and uh, your successes in the future. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Bye.